Welcome to Getting Started with Fit for Purpose Land Administration. We're very happy that you took the time to get on this webinar. This is one of uh, two webinars in a series. Our next webinar will be November 27th or 28th, depending on where you are in the world. It will be on Enterprise Cadaster. And if you signed up for this webinar, you will receive information on that webinar in the coming weeks. We're very fortunate today to have two presenters from Cadaster International. Christian Lemon is a geodesist from Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands. He received his PhD from the same university, a domain model for land administration. And for those of you familiar with this, this market, this, uh, this domain, uh, LADM, as we call the land administration domain model, uh, is the backbone of what you're going to see today, and we're very fortunate um, to have to have Crit here. He's a geodetic advisor at Cadaster International, which is the international branch of the Netherlands Cadaster Land Registry and Mapping Agency. We also have Matilda Molendijk, who works as a regional manager for Latin America at Cadaster International. She's interested in these innovative approaches in land administration, such as this fit for purpose concept, and she works on the project Land Tenure for Peace. Other projects currently in pro progress are in Brazil, Cuba, Aruba, Suriname, and previous projects in El Salvador, Albania, Honduras, Guatemala, Suriname, Romania, Slovakia, and Bolivia. So you can see um, with, with Christian and Matilda, we have quite a geographic uh, representation. I'm Brent Jones, I'm the Cadaster Industry Manager for Esri, and I'll be your host today. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the question window. Here's a bit of instruction on how to do that. You can see that in your webinar, uh, your webinar screen. We'll have some time for questions at the end, so please type them in as we go along and we'll, we'll do our best to address them. For those not familiar, Esri is a, is a global company in over 1,000 national governments, 2,000 state and regional governments, 20,000 cities and local governments, 30,000 businesses, 3,000 utilities. Importantly, 5,000 NGOs who support this type of work and 7,000 colleges and universities. Land administration can be defined, and this is the UN definition, as the process of determining, recording, and disseminating information on ownership, value, and use when building and implementing land management policies. It's a broad definition, but state good spatial data, good spatial data management is required for good land administration. Today, we're gonna to talk about the ownership or the land tenure component. There are many benefits of good land administration, secure tenure, manageable, equi manageable taxation systems for equitable valuation and taxation, supporting good government functions, managing land disputes, protecting state lands, of course. Uh, but it's necessary for a strong economy to alleviate poverty and support land markets. There are many challenges with the traditional approach of land administration. It's often very difficult to share information. It's very difficult to deploy that information in multi-use environments. There's oftentimes a lot of duplicated effort. There's no common management view of the status of work in the organization. There are IT challenges managing servers, managing networks. It's very difficult to adapt organizations to changing priorities due to political environment and due to technology and due to staff churn. It's difficult to generate property statistics on what's actually happening on the ground, and these systems traditionally are very slow. These challenges are similar across the world, whether it's to improve customer satisfaction, increase efficiency, keep your data current, managing new security apparatus, providing access to data, transparent operations, adhering to standards, new devices. There are these, sim these challenges are common across the globe. Some of the trends we see in land administration is that cadaster is the basis of a national GIS. 
there, there are new ways to engage citizens. There are new ways to deploy data in multi-purpose environments. There is, a, there are movements to have more transparent and accountable operations. 3D and 4D applications, not just in ownership, but in value. Growing security concerns, as we see from the, the global cyber threats. Data workers are becoming fully connected and we're sharing data in a variety of new ways. We also see some trends in using off the shelf products. We can just plug them in and use them. A lot less custom development. Cloud infrastructure is maturing. The capabilities of the cloud grow rapidly. The data available in the cloud, the available the data available online is growing. The quality of data, the currency of the data is increasing. We see trends for faster data updating. We oftentimes want to get the data from a transaction to the web in a matter of days and not weeks, months, or in many cases, years. One trend that's particularly interesting to me is the ongoing data quality improvement. With, with Fit for Purpose, so we start with what we have and we build workflows and we build processes that improve our data over time. Very few organizations have the time or the money to begin mapping at survey accuracy. Start with what you have and build quality improvement processes. Lightweight apps and devices, which we'll talk quite a bit about today, community driven cadastral mapping and faster implementations. These trends wrapped up are fit for purpose. So we have a poll question. What are you using in the field for data collection? Uh, Brent, it looks like you had about 34% say they use laptop, 42% uh, said other, 19% on Android, 17% on iOS, and 17% using none at all. Okay, very interesting. I think we have the right audience for this webinar. Thanks, Kathleen. GIS technology is used in a lot of other systems besides, lot land systems besides our fit for purpose. We use it for property valuation, analyzing transactions, building integrated systems. We'll talk a bit about field data collection, managing leases, addresses, and of course for national portals. Going to dig a little bit into some technology here. I think it's important to understand the the components that make make up this solution. We're rapidly moving from a client server environment to a web services and app environment. We're moving from data models that cross organizations and agencies to web maps and layers that, that we share across organizations. We're moving from custom applications to configure config configurable templates and apps, standalone desktops to connected desktops, static data to real time, single servers to distributed computing and distributed GIS, proprietary data to open data and shared services, 2D to 3D, spatial analysis is, is growing into spatial, temporal and big data analytics, and digital cartography is moving into some smart mapping capabilities. All these modern approaches enable new capabilities. Today, we're going to talk about the top three, the web services and apps, web maps and layers, and these configurable templates. It's important to understand web services, and I'm going to take a minute on this because this is the backbone of how these, this technology operates. A web service is essentially a dial tone of your data in your system. You control who does what. You control whether they can just view the data whether they can query the data or whether they can edit the data. And that access is controlled via identity. Without identity, you can't manage security. So that's how we manage security is through an identity, which allows you also to monitor and track how that information is collected. Now these web services, you use these every day. You'll pull up a map on your, on your Android or your iPhone and you'll click on that map. When you see the map, that's a, that's a map service coming from somewhere in the cloud. You pick two points on that map and it returns those points to a route service which returns you a route. You don't like the map, 
and you change the map to an image that's an image service. So these apps are services mashed together to perform functions. It's very important that we understand how these services connect with each other because these services can be generated from all types of data. They can be, of course, generated from GIS and other maps and imagery, but from other business systems, whether it's a registry system or whether it's a valuation system or whether you need to collect data real time, that, that those services are mashed into maps and layers that are consumed in desktops, web applications and mobile devices, enabling you to use your data anywhere, anytime, and on any device. Some of these apps that are powered by services uh, that we use in land administration, there's Collector for ArcGIS, there's an operations dashboard which allows you to see the activities in your organization. There's a, a simple mapping application, Explorer for ArcGIS, there's drone to map which enables a drone workflow for collecting imagery to go directly into your GIS. It's pretty cool. Uh, Insights for ArcGIS, a new analytical tool for understanding trends and patterns in your data. For those that use Excel, there's a there's maps for office which enables mapping and analytical capabilities inside Excel. There's ArcGIS Earth for performing other mapping tasks. Today, we're going to talk about just Collector. There are hundreds of other apps. The majority of these apps are open source and published. We group these apps into solutions, much like your, your phone that you use today. If there was only one app on your phone, it would be very difficult to use. These apps are targeted for very specific workflows, very specific users. There, there are solutions for state and local governments, utilities and telecommunications, emergency management, public safety, and military and security apps. These apps can also be looked at field apps, office apps, and apps to engage the community, sometimes to share information out to the community, and sometimes to collect data back from the community. We don't use code building these apps. We use app builders. We can configure existing apps that allow us to, to do some simple tasks. There are web app builder tools where we visually construct an app. And these, these apps that we construct are responsive. They know whether it's an Android or an iPhone or a desktop. So we can, con we can configure these apps very, very quickly and easily. And then for the, the high-end developers that want apps to run exactly on a native device. There are tools for that as well. I mentioned online data. The Living Atlas is a compilation of tens of thousands of maps and layers of data and base maps compiled from the best available sources, whether it's imagery, demographics, landscape, or street level data. These maps are ready to use and consumable on any of your devices at any time. They're a key component in fit for purpose land administration. It saves an incredible amount of money by not having to gather photogrammetry, not having to gather street level data. Uh, it's all available and ready to use. Now, you may be aware of the ArcGIS Enterprise Cadaster solutions for parcel management field operations, valuation analysis, and public relations and constituent engagement. We're not gonna talk about that today. We're gonna, we're gonna save that for November 27th. We, this is one of my favorite quotes from Henry Ford. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have asked, they would have said faster horses. This is how we are with land administration. We can do our traditional cadastral processes faster. We can do them better, uh, but they do not necessarily leverage some of the innovation that that has taken place. We need to leapfrog. We need to jump over our current thinking and enable a new way of thinking about cadastral and data collection. We need things to be simple and we need them to use devices that we use every day. We want systems that are fast to implement that are based on standards 
they need to be low cost, they need to be highly accurate. We can't afford software development. We don't have time. We don't have the resources to sustain custom software. So we need them secure. We need to use external data, many devices. We have to be, build this future-proof. We don't want to build this and then rebuild this in five years. And we want to scale this. We want it repeatable. And we need to be able to work disconnected. Either the cellular coverage can be spotty, data can be expensive, so we need to work in a in a disconnected environment. So we can take a high accuracy GPS. We can connect that with Bluetooth to a mobile device. In this case, we're using the collector app, which is consuming a service and also consuming services from the Living Atlas, the online content, leveraging all these open standards, including the land administration domain model, and then leveraging these in ArcGIS Online in the cloud. So just a moment on Collector, because this is the backbone of how we're collecting data. It's a map-centric data collection tool that allows you to connect an external GPS device and it can work offline. It leverages the native device location services inside your Android or your iPhone, and it will display the accuracy when you're collecting data. You can enable a filter that says, I don't want to collect any data unless it's better than two meters or three meters. And when the data, generally data is collected in WGS84, if your maps are not in WGS84, the GIS system handles that transformation on the fly. So we have another poll question. What accuracies do you require? It looks like the majority of people, about 32%, need a centimeter accuracy. And then we had about 22 and 25 percent need either submeter or one to three meter accuracy. Um, and then a smaller percentage of folks either don't know or need about a decimeter. OK, that's great. Thanks, Kathleen. The good news is choose your own GPS, whether you want to use a Trimble RTK or Spectra Precision RTK receiver or a Bad Elf or Septon Trio. All the GPS receiver needs to do is output a GPS via Bluetooth on, a, on the NMEA string. Almost all modern GPS devices do that. So all accuracies are enabled. Just pick which GPS you'd like. So now we're going to pass the presentation to to Christian. He is um, going to speak uh, about a case study in Kenya where they have actually done this work. Okay, Crit. Yeah. Good morning. Good evening. Good night. Wherever you are, welcome from uh, Appledoorn in the Netherlands. Well, that was an amazing poll about the accuracy. I will come back to that uh, later. I, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So the Fit for Purpose Land Administration, I was happy to contribute in this development uh, together with Professor Stig Enemark from Denmark and Dr. Robin McLean from the United uh, Kingdom. Stig Enemark was the principal uh, author. So they also bring uh, contributions to my presentation. I always start with this uh, slide, uh, an overview of our blue planet. And uh, well, each generation there are more people, but the amount of land remains the same. So this causes all kinds of tangents, economically, politically, and also ecologically, uh, especially if you think about the climate change. And I think uh, we really need an overview of people to land relationships uh, to bring order in this uh, system. And that is in fact the ambition of the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, they were agreed in September 2015 in, in New York by, the world, by our world leaders. And you see here ambitions of the world, there's no poverty, no hunger, uh, gender equality, sustainable cities. And this no poverty goal includes uh, attention to, to tenure and tenure security. And in fact, uh, it is written there that uh, in, by 2030, 
they should be overview worldwide. So if you remember that in this moment only 70%, only 30% uh, of the people to land relationships are documented, then you still have a, a job to be done. So talking about land rights, basically we, we talk about the relations between people and land. And those relations can be all types, all kinds of uh, relations. And pieces of land are, are represented in, in spatial uh, units. But basically, this is where it is about. It is about land, pieces of land, land rights, relations between people and land and people. Uh, so this fit for purpose uh, land administration uh, is about uh, I bring some context now, the cadastral gap. Only 40 countries in the world have well-functioning land administration systems. And in most developing countries, less than 10% of the land is included in formal systems. And as I said, 70% of the people to land relationships are not formally documented. And it is often uh, assumed that, that Western-style uh, European systems uh, can be used in, in uh, developing countries, but this is not the case because Western style systems are too costly and too time consuming and capacity demanding. And they do not serve uh, the millions of people whose tenures are predominantly social rather than legal. Uh, in fact, Western style systems in, in developing countries serve the, the elite. A fit for purpose approach will ensure that uh, basic and appropriate land administration systems are built within a relatively short time frame and at affordable cost. And that is uh, also when, when we talk about uh, accuracy, it is uh, directly related to the amount of money that is available and the amount of uh, money that people have to pay for cadastral services. So what is it? Basically, uh, the system should be designed for serving the basic purposes such as including all line, land, so complete coverage, provide security of tenure for all, so for old, young, uh, male, female, rich and poor, and for control of use of land, uh, rather than being guided by, guided by high-tech solutions and, and costly and time-consuming field survey procedures. The system should be flexible, so scale and accuracy relate to, to geography. An urban environment is really something else than a rural environment, and that is also related to accuracy demands. And the legal and institutional framework should be designed to, to accommodate both legal and social tenure rights. So it is not only about formal uh, property, it is also about informal and customary people to land relationships. And then if the data are collected, uh, incremental improvement of the quality uh, is, is uh, possible if needed. So here we have the key principles uh, behind uh, the fit for purpose land administration approach. Uh, the, the fit for purpose land administration is built around a, a spatial framework and a legal framework and an institutional framework. You see on this slide a few key principles. Let us focus to the, the, the key principles behind the spatial framework. So in the fit for purpose approach, we, the idea is to, to work with visible, physical, or let's say general boundaries rather than fixed or monumented uh, boundaries. The idea is to use aerial or satellite imagery rather than field uh, uh, surveys. I mean, field surveys uh, conventional field surveys. And the QR standards, set and, and so for updating and opportunities for upgrading uh, and ongoing improvement uh, should be fulfilled. Uh, in the, in the uh, publications, you can also find the descriptions uh, of the, the key principles behind the legal and institutional framework. So what are the needs worldwide? We need an overview of existing uh, tenancy, the complete coverage. So all people to land relationship. It should be legally documented and most of, important of all, it should be maintainable. So it should be possible to include 
updates. And it should be faster than the existing procedures. It should be cheaper, much cheaper, because in many countries, uh, let's say a land transaction, the costs are between 200 and 500 dollars. Uh, we think it is better to think about uh, between between one dollar and twenty dollars, and it should be it should be good enough. So the the accuracy uh, should meet the requirements. It is very important that there is an integrated approach. So that and here we see the the screen of the collector app, uh, and also the the land administration domain model data model behind it that is uh, included in the functionality of the the, the collector app. It is about spatial data and it is about legal administrative data that are collected uh, uh, at the same time in, in the field by one uh, grassroots surveyor or maybe a professional if needed. So uh, approaches should be more fit for purpose and demand driven. Here you see uh, the main publications about the fit for purpose land administration. One of them uh, with World, uh, from World Bank and the FIG, the International Federation of Surveyors, and one uh, from the Global Land Tool Network and UN Habitat in cooperation with uh, Cadastre International. It is very important to see that it is not, as I said before, that it is not only about formal people to land relationships, also informal and uh, customary people to land relationships should be included and should be integrated in, in one system and not in many different uh, systems. So now our case study in Kenya that was uh, organized together with the Institution of Surveyors of Kenya, Cadastre International and uh, ESRI. We were most welcomed to, by, the, by the people in the village where the test was performed. Uh, we had a series of handheld uh, lightweight uh, devices. Um, so on the, on the photo on the left, you see the, the GPS uh, data collector uh, devices and the, and the mobile phone with the collector app installed. And the, the identification of the land object was done by the people themselves. So we did give the, the, the GPS device in the hands of the land owners and land users. And then they could uh, run the perimeter of the, the border of the cadastral uh, property of the property and the surveyor was there to collect uh, the data uh, observed with the GPS device in the uh, collector app. It worked very fine. The people understood very well what to do and uh, it worked also very, very fast. Then we did uh, with the same collector of app take a photo of the ID of the, of the person in Kenya all citizens have an ID. So that uh, allows us to, to link directly in the field the, the data on people with the data on land. And then the results were presented uh, in this case in the, in the church of the village. The whole community was there to confirm um, the, the ownership or land use uh, rights combined with uh, the polygon. People could very well understand and uh, uh, read uh, the collected data. And in the background, you see the data from this available in this living uh, atlas as uh, Brent uh, introduced. Maybe some uh, words about uh, accuracy. I, I have a statement here from Jack McKenna. It is, it's a director of business development uh, from Trimble in Africa and the Caribbean. And he says it's, it's time to stop thinking of uh, accuracy in terms of centimeter accuracy. And I very much agree with that because if you come to centimeter accuracy, it means you have to, to fix and monument uh, the boundaries. And that is a very time consuming and expensive uh, um, activity. I would go for, for submeter accuracy. Uh, do it very fast as we did in, in Kenya. We could uh, collect about uh, 60 parcels in a few hours of time, uh, confirmed uh, uh, land rights by the by the people, a very participatory uh, approach and, and easy to organize with um, like that. The data were available in the cloud. So when we were presenting the data to the to the people, 
we could read the data sets as collected in the field directly from the from the cloud. So it is not only an app, it is also a cloud service. Uh, I want to close with this uh, brand. I agree. That's one thing we discuss with the uh, the ability to bring in workflows that improve your data over time as the accuracy is required. The if needed, uh, if needed, if needed, that that's that's absolutely correct. The there are many countries, many developed countries in the world that do not have centimeter accuracy of their map of their property boundaries. Uh, naming Great Britain as one of those that uses general boundaries as well. Exactly. Okay, Crit, thank you very much. Now we're going to pass the screen to Matilda, and Matilda's going to show a short video um, of what happened in Kenya, and then she's going to speak about Colombia. <music> Estimates suggest that 70% of people-to-land relationships worldwide remain undocumented. Innovative approaches to register first land rights are therefore needed. The Dutch Cadaster, the Institution of Surveyors in Kenya, the Kenyan Ministry of Lands and Physical Planning, and the county government, in close collaboration with software and hardware providers, have piloted a fit-for-purpose method to register people-to-land relationships in Makueni County, Kenya. The village elders and locals are informed to ensure awareness and involvement of all parties. Villagers collect data themselves in the field by walking the perimeters of their own parcels with a GPS antenna, which boosts community involvement. The boundaries are often easy to recognize by fences or sisal plants placed on the boundaries. The surveyor records the observations with the ESRI collector app. Herewith, the boundaries are digitally drawn onto a satellite image. The data is collected in an integrated way. The perimeter of the parcel is stored together with the type of claimed right, combined with a photo of the owner or claimant and a photo of his or her ID. Because disputes in the pilot area are mapped, overlaps between parcels may be possible. These overlaps give the corresponding authorities insight into the existing types of land-related conflicts. At a village meeting in the local church, the community members gather to view all the collected data. The presented data is loudly confirmed by the community. This test demonstrates that field data collection and handling can be carried out in a fast, affordable and reliable way by using a fit-for-purpose land administration approach. Yes, Brent. Um... Uh, and uh, Christian, I think this gives a very good uh, visual image of the work and the methodology that uh, Christian was talking about. Um, and again, if there are any questions, there is the chat function at the GoToWebinar software to, to ask your questions. Um, is it all right now, Brent, that I start with the, the case study from Colombia? Yes, please do. Okay, uh, so good day to everybody. I'm very happy that you joined this, uh, this webinar. Um, I will talk about a similar experience that we did in Colombia. Uh, I ca called it here the case study of post-conflict Colombia because as you all probably know, last year in September there was a peace treaty signed between the rebels, the FARC, and, uh, and the government. And one of the main issues in this peace treaty uh, is about land and how to solve land conflicts. Now, as you all know, and Brent also touched upon the topic, uh, land registration is very important because it gives people legal security to their plots of land. And also, it's, uh, people are more inclined to invest in their land once they are 
they have been documented in the existing systems. So uh, one of the things that uh, stands out in this peace treaty is that the Colombia wants to have full coverage of the land administration in Colombia within seven years. Now you can imagine that is a huge task and if you continue the traditional way that land administration um, uh, happens in the world, it might take many, many decades to get that task uh, done. But the government and the FARC have said no, seven years for full coverage uh, uh, of land administration in the whole country. And if you recall that 60% in the rural areas is, does not have a formal title, and if you also take into account that it might cost um, $400 to measure a parcel, if you have millions of parcels to go, it takes a, uh, a lot of time and it's a very costly process. So it's really time to talk about new and innovative ways to, uh, to uh, in the field of land administration. And that is where the collector app uh, comes in. So we are very happy that there is this uh, collector app and I would like to present uh, um, how we use the collector app very much comparable to the Kenya case study but then applied in post-conflict Colombia. Um, so here you see some uh, some photographs of, uh, of a proof of concept we carried out uh, one and a half year ago so you can see that we work with the collector app on a mobile phone connected with a GPS device, the R1 in this case of uh, Trimble. And you can also see on the images that uh, owners can walk the per perimeters of their parcel. Um, uh, they can measure the points. Uh, it will automatically be stored in the Esri collector app. And well, basically um, it, there were of course there was a surveyor to um, coordinate the field work, but basically the work could be done by the people themselves. Um, here you see some information on the, on the connection with the R1 of, of, uh, of Trimble. So we could use submeter accuracy, which is uh, uh, in many rural areas in Colombia, that is more than sufficient because it has to be related to the objective and also of the price of the rural property. So in this case, this worked out perfectly. So the concept is that we uh, work with a GPS. Uh, we used autophotos, like Christian explained, is one of the principles of this fit for purpose uh, methodology. We used an app which was based on the ESRI collector for ArcGIS. Within the ESRI collector app you can also uh, use the LADM model, the land administration domain model, which was very important for us. And for us it's also very important that the data on the parcels and the administrative data on the persons are integrated. Uh, in many countries in Latin America, you see that the that the cadaster and the registry are two different institutions, and often it is very difficult to connect a, a parcel map to to a title or a title to a parcel map. So the wonderful thing in this uh, proof of concept was that we could collect both type of data at the same time, because in reality it is it is integrated. Um, well, the, uh, we stored all the data in the clouds and the participation of the owners or the users of the land uh, in the collection of the data is very important. Here you can see two screenshots uh, where you can see where we measured the parcel. It is on top of an orthophoto and each of the white uh, circles indicates that we measured a point at that location. If you look then at the more administrative data, the screen looks a little bit like this and you can also see on the left side on below that you can make uh, photographs. Uh, 
um, for example, photographs of the identity cards of the people, which is really great because then you can't make mistakes in writing or in writing down the number, the ser civil service number of people. So you can just make a photograph of the ID card people have. You can also make photographs of the of the documents they have. You can make uh, a selfie of the or the owner can make a selfie, and everything is integrated in in uh, in the same uh, archive. So it's that that is important for us in this test. Um, well, here are some other uh, examples of the screenshots. And here you can see that two persons, Jaime on the left and Dilma on the right, they both are owners of one parcel. So they share, uh, they have a 50% share in the, in the parcel. Um, so you see that this is really an integrated approach. The focus in for us is it's also on land titling, so not only making cadastral maps, but really reaching to land titles, because what people want is this legal security and not a, a cadastral map without a title. That is very difficult for people to, to understand. They want a title. So we focus as well in our project on land titling. When the field work goes on, the surveyor in the, in, in, in the office has this on his or her screen so she can see the how the measurements are going and uh, she can also correct uh, um, measurements if if you see on the screen that things don't go right so this is a, a, a very useful tool to correct uh, the data collection process uh, when the people are still in the field if you click then on such a parcel the surveyor can also see, or the legal person can also see the data attached to that parcel. So who's the owner? Who are the, par who are the parties in this case? Um, so this is what you need uh, when doing this fit for purpose pilot. Um, as I said before, the accuracy is related to the value of the land. Uh, and it also allows for differences. So when we did the poll, there were different answers and it would be nice to see uh, if people were referring more to urban areas or, or valuable areas. But in our case, we are uh, focusing on rural post-conflict areas. So the value of the land is not so high. Uh, so sub-meter accuracy is, uh, is more than enough in our, in our pilot. As you can also see, we use the... Um, um, the LADM model. So it's between the spatial unit, the parties, and the right between the spatial unit and the, and the parties. The nice thing is that using this LADM uh, data model within the, the app, it allows for standardized information and it makes the data integrated and also interoperable. So that all the institutions that are responsible for certain blocks in this model can uh, inter-exchange uh, the data. So what you see if you compare the both uh, uh, alternatives, you can choose to have a rapid land administration, let's say within 10 years, or, you, or in the traditional way, it can take 100 years. It, you can also continue by implementing high costs uh, land administrations, or you can go for the more low cost and participatory uh, uh, land administration. Also in alternative one, let's say the traditional, the conventional way of land administration, it's very much technology driven. Uh, whereas in fit for purpose, you see that it is more demand driven. And you can also see a, a difference that in a conventional methodology is rather rigid. And this fit for purpose is transparent because everyone, not only the surveyor can see the results on the on, on the maps and the measurements coming in, but the whole village can see these results and they can discuss with each other uh, whether the correction, whether the measurements are correct or whether there are errors. So this participatory aspect and the transparency is very important as well. Then this is the last slide. We are now starting a new. So we have done this proof of concept which is now uh, followed up by 
two pilot projects in uh, in Colombia that we are now starting up. Um, we that together with the Agencia Nacional de Tierras, so the National Land Agency, and here on this screen you can see the um, uh, the, the, the area. So it, here's on the left upper photograph you can see the the villages. It's in a municipality called Apartado and the Caribbean coast, near to the Caribbean coast of, uh, of Colombia. It's really post-conflict, so the, uh, there is a lot of uh, police and, and military active in the region to, uh, to be sure that other groups don't take over the power of the FARC when, because they're con concentration areas. Here you can also see uh, on, on the uh, below you can see uh, uh, an owner of a parcel holding the, the the GPS indicating the the boundary of the parcel, and on the right side is a lady from the registry, so from the land registry, uh, and she also joined us with a test on measuring the parcels because it's important that the people of the registry also understand. The, the vocabulary of the surveyors. Um, so we are about to start in February. We will start with the first uh, field measurements, and I hope that if this, uh, if you have another webinar branch uh, next year, that I can tell more about the results uh, of, of of these pilots we are carrying out with ANT in Colombia. We'll certainly do that. All right. Thanks, Matilda. Very good presentation. We're going to um, continue to take questions in the chat window, so please continue to fill those out. The uh, We'll take those in just a few minutes. We have a few uh, wrap-up slides that we would like to, uh, to go through, and then we'll begin to address the questions. For those questions that we don't have time to get to, we will be more than willing to take those questions offline. So what you saw in both cases was an Android device connected to an external GPS with Bluetooth collecting data into the land administration domain model in ArcGIS Online in the cloud. One of the questions was, does this work disconnected and how does that work? It does work disconnected. Prior to going into the field, you cache the data in the area where you want to work and you can work entirely disconnected. So then the that once in ArcGIS Online in LADM, that data can be used, viewed, shared via web browsers and desktops. And then this also scales to enterprise systems. The scaling, what we saw today was simple devices working in a very contained environment. This can scale to much larger environments using the exact same devices, the exact same data models, and the exact same technology and can scale to an entire enterprise cadastral system. I'd like to go through just a couple of resources. Um, get ready for your screen captures um, and we will send this information in our follow-up to the webinar as well. If you're not a member of GeoNet, this community can help you answer questions online forums peer-to-peer uh, -peer conversations. We also have a, a land records meetup. You feel free to join this. This is um, open to anyone. These are all recorded so you can go back and listen to uh, previous recordings. This is a very informal environment where we, de where we dig into quite a bit of the technology. And you please screen capture this. Uh, one of the questions was, how do we get these apps? Uh, if you go to the land administration or land record solution page, you can download those apps. Uh, there's a nice tool for learning ArcGIS online that can help you get started. If you're curious about the global data sets and the currency and quality of that data, you can go to the Living Atlas homepage. More technical details on collector are on this site. Here's the land records meetup page. And then we also have connect with an expert for detailed questions. You can log into that site. So if you don't screen capture that, um, I'll come back to that. Um, but we're now going to take some questions. Um, let me, I'll just, I'll leave this, uh, I'll leave this, these up while we take the questions. Here's a question, Crit, this is a good one for you. Uh, 
What number of parcels were captured a day by your team and how big were the teams in these two examples? I guess let's look at both of the examples, both Columbia and, uh, uh, and Kenya. So what were the number of parcels collected and how big were your, were your teams? Well, the team was uh, one person. So the, the, the collector app uh, was in the hand of the surveyor or grassroots surveyor. The data were collected by the people themselves with the GPS device. The surveyor was always close to the, to the landowners because this Bluetooth connection is uh, maybe limited to 10 meters in the field or something. But basically, uh, one one person uh, uh, for each team. And and uh, the amount of parcels uh, in the village, there were small parcels, and I think uh, uh, it, it was about, uh, if you say bring it to eight hours per day, uh, there can be 40 or 50. And in the rural areas, uh, you know, let's say between 10 and 50. And all this depends, of course, uh, on, on the field conditions. Uh, Mountainous areas is more difficult than, than, than flat area and so on. But uh, so in in the in the village forty in the to fifty in, in the rural areas ten to fifteen. Yeah, in to, uh, in Colombia there was a quite a difference, of course, if you talk about uh, flat areas or mountainous areas. So in a flat area, a typical parcel of let's say five, uh, five hectares or below five hectares. We walked the boundaries of the parcels and uh, it took, let's say, some 20 minutes. We had one uh, more difficult parcel, a very hilly parcel, where the surveyor said that it would easily take them uh, four days to a week. And we did it in, uh, in, in one hour. These are, of course, uh, examples from the proof of concept. But if we start with the, with the pilots in Apartado and, and in, in another area in Vistarmosa in, in Colombia, the costs and time that it takes to measure a parcel are one of the main elements we want to investigate. So, so we are very keen on looking at exact uh, in, uh, information on time and costs in the pilots that we are going to do in Colombia. The, uh... Thanks, Matilda. Here's here's another question. I'll take this question. For an NGO to be able to assist a village communities that are, what are the costs of equipment and software? We have a not-for-profit program, and I can, I can, if you search not-for-profit ESRI, you'll you'll come up with our not-for-profit program. So we have a we have special programs designed for NGOs to help with uh, with these particular applications. Um, is the collector app for ArcGIS free? The answer is yes, and the majority of all these apps are free if you're using the ArcGIS platform. Um, there's a question, Crit, on the ROI in in Kenya. Have you done calculations on ROI in general or in particular in Kenya? O R I. Sorry, I. I uh, oh, I'm it. sorry. Uh, return on investment. So essentially, the cost of this methodology compared to uh, traditional methodology. Yeah, that is uh, one of the big questions and, and, and the most fundamental question. The problem is, of course, that uh, the data are collected in an integrated way, but after field data collection, they have to be separated to the land registry part and to the cadastral uh, part. And that makes it a very cost uh, intensive uh, uh, process. So the reality is that we can collect data in an integrated way, cheap and fast, but let's say we have to, to bring them to the traditional uh, registry and uh, cadastre, and those uh, organizations are, are separated and that makes the, the cost uh, high. I cannot give, uh, uh, let's say real cost, but the, the problem is in the data handling uh, afterwards because of the institutional setting. Okay, another question about Kenya. Um, did you work with the local land surveyors to make this happen? What's the, what's the status of that? There, there was a, a very strong cooperation with the uh, 
institution of surveyors in Kenya. We will present the results uh, on a big conference of uh, the uh, ISK, the Institution of Surveyors of Kenya, in uh, November of this year. So that is uh, next month. And uh, the surveyors are, are very much interested in the approach because normally in, in the conventional uh, setting, it takes uh, maybe four days to, to, to survey a monument and, and uh, map uh, one parcel. Um, with this uh, alternative approach, it takes, uh, let's say, a few minutes. Uh, and and uh, so that, that brings the perspective of uh, national coverage. And then all the parcels of Kenya uh, can be uh, will be included and have to be maintained. And that is, of course, uh, from a business perspective, uh, uh, a very attractive perspective. And I think this is uh, really, really very well understood by the surveyors of uh, Kenya. And we will have a debate uh, on this approach uh, during the conference in, in November. Thanks, Crit. And, and thanks to you, Matilda, as well. Um, we're unfortunately out of time. Uh, we can take more questions at the at the bottom link of the page at Get Started Land. Um, I'd like to again thank Cadastro International for their for their help and their continued commitment to fit for purpose land administration. And I'd like to thank Kathleen Ojob, who's behind the scenes uh, of this webinar, making everything happen. And of course, I would like to thank all attendees. Um, your time is valuable and hopefully this webinar provided information for you. And if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to log in uh, and, and send them to us. And we're, we're more than happy to help you. Again, thank you. And uh, for some good morning, for some good day, uh, and for some good evening.